Welcome, everyone. We're so grateful to have you here. And I, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing my dear friend, Karen Francis McCarthy, using the immense power of mediumship to heal the heart progressive Irish medium, best-selling author and public speaker, Karen Francis McCarthy strives to provide comfort in your time of need. She blends the Celtic mysticism of her upbringing with the loving kindness of her Buddhist practice to bring messages of joy, healing, and support from loved ones in spirit form. An advocate of the ethical practice and healing potential of mediumship, Karen underwent years of intensive training at the world-renowned Arthur Finlay College in England, and she holds three awards, certificates of recognition in mediumship, spiritual healing, and public speaking from its governing body, the Spiritualist National Union. She's currently a PhD candidate researching the cultural narrative informing contemporary ghost literature at the prestigious Russell Group University of Birmingham in the UK. And on a personal note, I've known Karen now for about 15 years, and I have to say, she is a loving presence in my life, and I hope that you get as much from our discussion and our talk today as I do every time I interact with Karen. Um, so Karen, welcome. Thank you, Court, for a very, very fabulous introduction. And I'd like to say thank you to David for coming in costume for the, for the night that's in it. <laughs> And of course, thank you to all of you. It's lovely to see you. There's some very, there's some very familiar faces and some new faces. So very nice to meet you all this evening. So I kind of wanted this evening to be sort of entertaining. It's Halloween. It should be a little fun, a little bit informative. And um, so I, you know, we'll have a bit of a chat, uh, and we'll, we'll, court will take questions after. We'll just sort of talk a little bit about sort of the history and the origin of of um, Samhain and or what, what's now called Halloween and um, how it has sort of become Halloween essentially and then I also want to talk a little bit about what are called in Ireland the thin places so we'll work away and we'll have a little chat about the thin places as we go and how we can all create our own thin place perhaps if you feel so inclined but first um, just a little background I'm sure some of you will know know this already so just bear with me but Samhain, um, I think someone was calling it Sam Hain and couldn't understand when I was saying it was Samhain, but it's a Gaelic word. It actually just means November. It just means just the month of November in Gaelic. But so Samhain is, um, you know, it's the, it's the end. It, it sort of originated in Celtic Ireland, in ancient Ireland, and it really marked to the end of the harvest. So after the harvest was taken in, people were getting ready for what was called the dark time of the year. And so, of course, as with everything folkloric, when you're heading into the dark time of the year, lots and lots of stories and traditions and rituals are inevitably going to rise up around it. So what has to typically happened with Samhain, because we were going from harvest and then going into the dark time of the year, it essentially was perceived as it was the time of the year when the year was dying, the light was dying, the year was dying, nothing could grow. And so it became, you know, in folklore, associated then with all things, death, dying, ghosts, whatnot, all of this sort of naturally just sort of arose out of these folklore beliefs. Now, what I would like to do is, you know, just give you a little bit of the actual real story of the history of it, which is kind of interesting, but near, not nearly as interesting as the spooky parts of, of Samhain. But I mean, originally, um, the first mention of it actually is from ninth century Irish literature. It was, it was mentioned as a pagan festival um, in a spiritual tradition. Really, as I said, it came out of the harvest tradition because the Celts of the time were, were just um, agriculturists and had herds and planted fields. So as they started moving into the dark time of the year, a three day festival was had starting on the 31st of October. Now we know what's happened to the other two days been appropriated by the church, but these traditions have still remained around the 31st of October. And what would happen was while everybody in all of the villages were out clearing their fields, though there were no fires lit at home. And so what would happen when the harvest was finally in, the local druid 
would you know build they would have a huge bonfire and the local druid would, pres would preside over this bonfire and it was really just a ritual and gratitude for the harvest and whatnot the cattle poor things were sacrificed and then after this this sort of ritual around the bonfire this gathering around the bonfire this celebration everybody would take a little bit of the flame home to light their hearth that hadn't been lit for the whole duration of um, the harvest. Now, in one of the thin places in Ireland, and I'll get on to thin places later, is Tara, the Hill of Tara. And the Hill of Tara, I have a picture of it actually. Hang on, let me show you this. But, well, area of, this is Tara from the air. This is the seat of the High Kings of Ireland. There's a little prison over there, I'll show you, that's still standing since for like 3,000 years, but we'll get to that in a moment. And the high kings used to, this is where, this is where they're, they're, they lived. There were forts built on these hills. Um, and so what happened was the high kings would call all of their subordinates, all of the, the, the chieftains, the local kings were the chieftains, they would call everybody up for a feast at Tara every seventh Samhain. And that's where they would devise all the new laws, all the new rules, and dole out all of the punishment for all of the people that um, didn't sort of stick to them. And then, of course, what started happening, obviously, was that um, over time and into the Middle Ages, instead of having the one massive bonfire and everybody showing up at Tara to be sort of told what the new rules were or punished for transgressions, people just started building the little bonfires locally, which we still do today. You know, they would just, each little village would build its own bonfire and everybody would gather around it after the harvest. Now, of course, you put a whole bunch of people together around a bonfire as the year is considered to be dying. You know what's going to happen. There's going to be loads and loads of scary stories told. Um, there's, especially in Ireland, there are going to be all of the stories of the she. Now, the she, and I know Denise knows this because Denise Hartigan there is from Ireland, the she are what are today known as the fairies. But it's very important not to be beguiled by these because the she were originally gods. They were known as the, the, the Tua de Danon, the, the people of the Danon. Um, the short name for them is the she, S-I, Fada. I don't know what a Fada is in, you know, just a dash over the I. And um, they were or could always be relied on for sort of mischief and mayhem and a lot of good stories. And so of course, as people were gathering around these bonfires, it became the she, of course, to get invoked for everything. I mean, the banshee, you probably, a lot of you have heard of banshees. The banshee is just means, ban means woman and she means the she, the gods, the, the fairies or the, the ancient gods. The banshee is just that. I mean, I remember growing up and swearing as a kid I could hear the banshees screaming outside the bedroom window I was terrified because they used to tell you if you hear the banshees screaming don't look at her because she's going to be out there combing her hair with a golden comb and if she sees you looking at her she's going to throw that comb at you and kill you so you were never supposed to look at the, the banshees and I do remember one time being so terrified I was in bed six being so terrified at the, the screaming of the banshee outside the window that I went into my parents room and I woke them up and I said the banshee outside and my father came out and came into my room to look out the window and I was like don't look out the window I was so terrified the banshee would throw her comb at my father and kill him you know so of course 10 years later I learned that the banshees are actually were cats screeching outside the window but you know, this is how these things this is how these things evolve in the dark as you know so um the interesting thing about the she was they were are the uh, the ancient gods are very very powerful giants they became the she they became the fairies in order for the pagan celts to reconcile their old beliefs in the old gods with christianity when christianity arrived and since then hollywood has made them into these cute little things with wings but these were the, these were gods you never ever ever wanted to mess with now the king of the she was the dad the dad dad right? And strangely enough, they were considered, um, he was considered like the, the god of fertility, agriculture, strength, druidry, wisdom. And so the she were all very well when they were in their land, which was called the Tirnanog. Now Tirnanog means in Gaelic, the land of the youth. There's lots and lots of stories about people going to Tirnanog 
when and they think they're there for for a night and when they come back a hundred years has passed on earth and then all sorts of like things befall them when they when that happens but there this the Tiranonog is sort of outside time but it's also a fairly place of plenty until the she cross over into the world of the living which they do through the thin places which i'll get on to in a minute so of course on Samhain, prime time this was prime she time so there are forts let me share this again there are forts um all over ireland um where I, you, I have a little picture of the, this is a, an image um is this writing over the image or can you see it can you see yes it? we can see it karen we can see it with the writing in the image um so this is just an old this is an old cauldron that's that was being made i think in the second century a.d and this is a, an imprint of the dag the dagda he's the king of the two of the dana and so there are great stories about him around the solstice as well in newgrange which is a story for another day but let me just move this on if I can. That is actually the fairy mound at the hill of Tara. Now the fairy mounds, which some of you have probably heard of, the fairy mounds of the fairy hills, these are the gateways through which the she could leave Tirnanog and enter the, enter the, come into the earth, enter the land of the living. This one is still at Tara. It still looks like that. And it was apparently used, the high king would put people in there as prisoners but it's actually a, considered a fairy mound. Um, that's Newgrange, which is, I was just mentioning is part of the, is another thin place. This is a Neolithic, this build, this structure is 5,000 years old. And um, it has this inner chamber, very small inner chamber where they had, people were buried. Um, and it's dark all year round, except for sunrise on the winter solstice when the sun aligns with a little box over the entrance and floods the whole inner chamber with light. And then after the winter solstice, it goes into darkness again for the whole rest of the year. So this is considered a still, there's lots of these around Ireland, but none quite as huge and fabulous as Newgrange. They're dotted all over the country. Oh, there's me at the entrance. See, you probably see all these little swirls you see a lot in Celtic. This is where the swirls come from, this 5,000 year old stone at the entrance of Newgrange. Lock Crew is another one. That's me sitting in Lock Crew. This is another where there's mounds. These are all places. I mean, you can't you can't walk a mile in Ireland without tripping over a fairy mound or a thin place. I mean, they're everywhere. So, um, what would happen with the she is they would come out of these places. Now, when they were in Tiernanog, they're perfectly benign, perfectly benevolent. But when they came into the land of the living, they were very mischievous and more. So now this, what I was just showing you there, is Rock Rowan. And this is an old rendition of a whole, you can see massive community of structures. And um, this now is obviously now not there. This was a, a sketch that was drawn in 1834. You can see of the size of this, of this area. Today, this is it, right? So this looks like, any old hole in the ground, right? It's actually what's considered, it's a portal, first of all, it's a, it's a thin place for the sheet to come out of, there's a, that's a, an entrance into a cave, for the, to come out of the cave and in to run amok all over the land. Now, when the monks came along, the Christian monks came along in like four or 500 AD, and um, they decided this is the gateway to hell. And so this fairly innocuous little hole in the ground in the west of Ireland in County Roscommon, is now, as you know, the gateway to hell. Now, as you can see from a lot of stuff that's all, that's just sort of all hanging around the countryside everywhere in Ireland, you could there's no there's no one selling t-shirts, you know, there's no sort of signs on that you can just go along, wander around the countryside and fall into these things. So you have to be very careful. We'll get to that in the end. This is called Owen Nagat, which is the cave of the cats. It's called the cave of the cats. Funnily enough, I was just talking about cats. But as I said, the monks called it the gateway to hell. Now inside, it's a 50 meter long limestone cave that just goes for, for, and it's quite tall and it's been cut out. Now, what happens when you get into this cave is it's completely dark. Your eyes never adjust, your senses never adjust. 
and there's just this feeling of not being able to see or smell or hear and there's just this very disorientating feeling of being in this timeless space in the pitch dark you know and it just keeps going down and down down into the bowels of the earth which is probably why so much of the mythology has sprung up around it now any of you who ever want to go to ireland you're welcome to go to this place you can go into it you don't need tickets it's not like newgrange you can just kind of wander along if you find it in the field you're welcome to go in i'll give you some tips on what to do if you decide to do that a little later so the the um the cave of the cats is um was tip it was known to be the home of Maeve the queen of Connacht now in Celtic mythology the women were very powerful you know and so she was Maeve the queen of Connacht um, her name is actually inscribed in the old Irish script on the entrance to this cave but also it was associated with the Morrigan now the Morrigan was the goddess of war very duplicitous person. She could lead soldiers into victory or defeat, depending on how they, they treated her. I've got some pictures. There's a couple of pictures of sketches that people have done of the Morrigan. She was a shapeshifter. She could become a crow, which is why. And actually they say, can you hear, can you hear me, I froze? Yep. They say that the Morrigan said that the Morrigan was probably an influence on um, the raven, Poe's the raven, scary creature that that was. So she could fly around, shape ship, fly around like a crow, which so you need to be mindful if you see crows when you go to the thin places as well, that it could be the morrigan and you really didn't want to mess with her. Now what would happen from this very innocuous little entrance, like all of the thin places around Ireland, is the she could come out. Now the she could come out and of course, what do they do? First thing they would try to do is go steal your soul. They would try to steal the children, which is why W.B. Yeats wrote the poem, the stolen child, come away, oh human child, to the waters and the wild with a fairy hand in hand, which sounds beautifully lyrical, but really what's going on is the she come out, they steal the children, they go back into Tierney Oak, and that children are gone. You know, what, uh, what even more nefarious creatures could come out of there, you'd have uh, you know, three-headed devils, you could have animals reportedly whose breath was so foul that once they breathed, they, all of the plants everywhere, all of the life around them would just die, wither and die, the leaves would wither off the trees, pestilence would cover the land. Of course, this is the sorts of things that you run into if you start messing around with these th at these thin places, you know. Um, the other things that would happen is the slua, who are not to be messed with at all, the slew and Amar, the host of the dead would come along and they would come in through windows, especially the windows of houses where somebody was dying and they would steal away the dying person's soul before they could have their last rites. So these weren't to be messed with at all. Um, there was just, you know, they, the Dulan would come like impish creatures or sometimes headless horsemen would come and gallop around the country. So of course, all of these, all of these myths converge on Samhain, the darkest time of the year when the, when the earth is starting to die for the winter. And so all over Ireland, everywhere you go, you have these thin places that, um, you, that they are all emerging from, so you have to be careful. So what actually, the reason why a lot of our Halloween traditions have arisen the way they have arisen is because of the antics of the she and the slua and the Doolin and the whatever. So what ha would happen is, people would start dressing up as monsters or animals to try to disguise themselves, to make themselves look like the she. So the she would pass them by, would leave them alone. Hence, people started adopting costumes on Samhain. And then what they would do also was you needed to, if you went to, and I have a little story about this, I'll show you a picture somewhere. If you go to one of these thin places, what you would have to do is to appease the she so they wouldn't steal the dying or the children um, or, or, or cover the land in pestilence, because you've got to remember they've just taken in the harvest. They would bring them food and you would leave food um, for apples, hazelnuts, whatever. You would leave them there at the mouth of these thin places for the she to appease them so they would leave you alone. And what started happening was people would start going door to door to collect apples and hazelnuts and foods 
you know, to leave for the she, which is why we still go around the doors collecting nuts and apples and whatnot. These are all, you know, these days we eat them, but really we're supposed to leave them out for the she so they don't come steal your soul. So the next time you decide to eat the candy you picked, you collected out the door, remember, you actually have to leave some of it out for the she, or they might come in the window because they have a tendency to do that. So what also would happen, let's see what's next, that's all I'm gonna get. Oh, there's the slew and a marv. That's just a rendition of the slew and a marv. Now, I, nobody knows what they look. Who knows what the slew will look like? Because who knows if the slew are real? But this is what somebody decided they looked like. Now, this is me standing on a fairy mound somewhere up in Donegal in the northwest of Ireland. And it doesn't look like much, but that's actually a miniature dolmen. I'm you know, the dolmens, like, you know, the, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a stone on the top and then two stones holding it up and there's a gap underneath. So what they believed was that the dolmens, these fairy mounds are all over the place. They're everywhere in Ireland, the fairy mounds. It was Wyla came from Dublin and there was a fairy mound near our house and they built a chocolate factory up there on the land. But they built the chocolate factory around the fairy, it was a very tall hill. You know, I mean, they're mounds, they're, you know. They built the whole factory around the mound. So in the middle of this, this, this industrial estate is a bloody big fairy mound, you know, that nobody would mess with because you don't want to mess with the fairy mound. But like they still build around them. I mean, just recently, a few years ago, they were building a, a motorway across Ireland and uh, there was a fairy mound right in the middle of the path of it. And so what did they do? They split the motorway to go around the fairy mound, right? Because you don't mess with these fairy mounds, you really just don't. This is where the this is where the fairies are. It's where the she are. You can see on the top of them. You can see like little brambles and stuff. This fairy mound was in the northwest of Ireland, and there's a rumor also that they are on ley lines. If you if you know what the ley lines are, that all of these mounds. I mean, if honestly, if all of these mounds are on ley lines, then the ley there must be ley lines all over the place. Because I'm you can't swing a cat for 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 stumbling upon one of these things, you know. This one I'm standing on there um, was in the middle of a field that was perfectly ploughed, except for there was this huge, big, probably 20 foot wide in circumference, 20 foot in diameter um, thicket, you know, of all these brambles and bushes and stuff, um, just left in the middle of this farmer's field. And then all around him was all these perfectly ploughed, you know, lines. So they were taking the harvest and this would stay there. So myself and a friend of mine decided we're going to go and check out this fairy man, decided to climb into it. So we can't see it. We were all torn up. All our clothes got torn because it's all just there's just um, the brambles and thickets and, this, and you can't get it gets get all torn and scratched and everything, just trying to push your way into it. It's about 10 feet thick trying to get into the center of this thing. So we eventually got into the center of it. And what we discovered in the center of it was this a little miniature dolman in the center of it. So we had been told, oh, there's an energy point from these dolmens. So we decided, well, I'm going to stand on it and see if I can feel any energy, right? So two of us tried it out. Well, what we did first was we threw pennies under into the hole in the dolmen, because you have to appease the she first before you stand on the dolmen. So we threw a bunch of pennies, copper pennies, in under the, the rock and then stood on top of it and stood there for a while in the freezing cold trying to go, can you feel any energy? Can you feel any energy? And then we decided we couldn't. And then we fought our way back out and all our clothes were all torn and we were all scratched up. And when I got back in my car, in the car, the phone I had that was almost dead had charged. You know, so the phone felt the energy even if I didn't. So, you know, but if you do decide to beat your way through the thicket and the brush to get to into a fairy mound, make sure you throw something, you bring them something to leave there for them, or they won't, they'll follow you home, as so they say. So it was all also, I'll get rid of that, so you don't have to look at me standing on that fairy mound. Um, the other thing that is quite, um, was it part of the Druidic tradition, of course, around um, Samhain is um, that, the ancestors. So it's not just the she, it's not just the slua and the marv. The ancestors can also come back to visit. I know this comes up in a lot of different traditions across the world in Dia de los Martos, in India, in, in, you know, there's a lot of traditions where the dead come. And of course it comes on this day because this day 
being the cusp of the living world to the dying world becomes naturally in folklore the day of the gateway where the, where every, where the thin places are even thinner. And because those thin places are even thinner, the ancestors can now pass through the thin places and come to visit, which is why, you know, people would like the fire to welcome, they leave windows open to welcome them. Now you have to be very good to leave a window open because you don't want to risk having a slew and the marv coming in the window at you. But if you've been good, if you've done your gifts, if you've left your gifts out for the she, you can open the windows because your ancestors can come in the window to join you. And so what happened, this is where a lot of the Halloween traditions came about. You know, children playing games to entertain the ancestors. Well, they still play the games to answer, you know, the apple bobbing and stuff. I do want to say that on the, those things like apple bobbing and playing with and the, and the, the, the nutcrackers, I don't know all the traditions you do in America, but they did originate in Ireland. Um, they come from collecting the food door to door, right? But then they, of course, became, they became divination tools. So you start putting the apples in the water to try to divine, you know, when you were going to get married or all of, you know, all of these sorts of things that they would do. And they started using them as divination tools. Um, but, you know, the, then the children, this is where apple bobbing, do you do apple bobbing in America? Um, we do apple bobbing. Oh, yes. This is where, yeah, this is where this comes from. It's collecting the fruits to appease the she and then leaving them out with the ancestors and then the kids getting hold of them and making games out of them or people getting hold of them to see when they'd find their husband or whatnot. And this is where a lot of these traditions come from. So the thin places, as I mentioned, on, on Samhain, the thin places become even thinner. And so if you go to a thin place on Samhain, whether you have the ability in any other time of the year to recognize and receive and meet your ancestors, it's said going to a thin place on Samhain, you can actually then, you are so close to the other world, you can actually sense your ancestors. Now, before I just finish up with this, I do want to say that, um, you know, ultimately, um, as you know, Christianity came along two of the three celebration days became All Saints Day and All Souls Day. But the pagan traditions remained, despite the attempt of Christianity to sort of um, plop a new holiday onto it. And of course, then um, when, the, all, when the Irish started leaving Ireland in the mid 1800s and coming to America, they brought all of these traditions with them. And so it became also when the, well, sorry, when the church added on um, plopped All Souls Day and All Saints Day onto the other two days of the of the Samhain celebration. It became known as All Hallows Eve. So the thirty first became known as the Hallows, where the Hallowed people, the Hallowed Saints, were All Saints Day. So it became known as All Hallows Eve or Halloween, Hallow e Halloween evening. Um, and that's how we've kind of come. Out. And that's the name that got transported to America, which is why it's more commonly known as, as Halloween there. But um, they, they do say that if you do go to a thin place, now you do need to, you probably will have to go to Ireland to find your thin place, but you can probably Google, honestly, at this point, you could find them on Google Maps. Um, you, you won't have to go very far to find a thin place in Ireland, that's for certain. But if you do go, you have to remember that um, you have to uh, honour the she. So if you do go, make sure that you... Um, a, go in costume so the she can will think you're a she, right? And not try to kidnap you, steal your stone, drag you into the cave. And you also have to make sure you bring something, pennies or apples or something as a gift for the she, if you want to go and loiter around one of these close thin places and wait for your ancestors. Now, I will say that it is um, said that you can actually create your own thin place. So you don't have to jet off to Ireland and go tripping around the rocks and the holes in the ground. You actually, they say, you can actually create your own thin place. So whether or not you normally feel connected to the ancestors, you can just create your own thin place by setting up an area of ritual, you know, setting up a place in your home and, and, and bringing in your own ritualistic practices. And over time, sort of building from sitting there, you will imprint your own energy, you will build energy in that corner, for example, of your room. 
and um, you can start to build that energy. And in that way, you can make that area your own thin place. So over time, then your own ancestors will be able to come and visit you in your own filled place, which could be in the corner of your living room or your bedroom, whatever, you know. So you don't have to go tripping up, tripping off to Ireland to go schlepping around in the mud and the rocks to create your, your thin place. But, um, but you know, you can do it and you can, you can do that at Samhain if you do, just make sure you bring a gift, make sure you bring a disguise. If you're sitting in your own corner, building your own thin place in your own house, you, of course, you don't have to do that, but it's always a good idea to have a little gift handy for the she, just in case. Terrific. Well, Karen, are, are you ready to, uh, thank you so much for, for the talk and are you ready to start taking some questions? Sure, yeah. Terrific. We have one from Nelda and she asks first beforehand, please, if you have a question, send it through the chat and uh, we'll, we'll present it to, to, to Karen. The first question comes from Nelda. Is there a rough date for Tara? Tara? Um, yeah, it's not as old as Newgrange. I believe Tara is, is about um, 3,500 years old. I think 3, it's around 3, 5, I think it's 3,500 years old. I have to double check. Terrific. Uh, Karen, one of the things is, ah, we've got another question here coming from Margaret. All Hallows Eve, hallow means what? Hallowed, all hallowed, hallowed saints. You know, it's like um, the honored. Hallow is to, um, you know, is to honor. So the saints would be these beatified people that we should all bow down and worship. So we, ha they're hallowed individuals. Do you, does that make sense? So we have, you know, and so it's the evening of the hallowing, uh, really of, of, if I can say it that way, of the um, saints. Oh, Terrific. And Karen, you talked about, you talked about the thin places mm -hmm. and it's at times, it sounds like it is a location. At times, it sounds like it is a time. What do you think? It, first, do you think that there are times when the veil is thinner or is this part of just a, a cultural um, uh, a, a tradition? Well, um, the, the, the thin places are definitely places. Because uh, you know they're, they're all over the like La Croix, which I meant I showed you all of these fairy mounds are thin places, New Grange, all of the Neolithic structures are all thin places. These caves, like uh, Owen the Gat, is the most famous cave, which is a scary place. I mean, which is a scary place. Scary place is a, a place of the sheath, a thin place. So they definitely are places, you know, that are just dotted everywhere. You know, um, they. They're thin all the time, if that's what you meant by time. But there's, there, in folklore, there is supposed to be particularly thin on Halloween as we move into the cusp of the dark year. Gotcha, um, so there's thin places and then there's certain times when the veil is even thinner at those thin places. Well, yeah, I mean, the veil is always pretty thin at those places. You can sense it. I mean, anybody who, who has been to Newgrange the thing about Newgrange is it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site now, and I've done a story on that, which is a really, really interesting story, but I'm going to talk about more about that, the solstice, because it's really a solstice location. But there are other, lots of other mounds that align with different, the two different equinoxes, the summer and winter solstice. Um, and so these, these places are around, but um, if you go to the Boyne Valley, I mean, these Neolithic structures are all over the Boyne Valley. Um, which is in Meath, not far from Dublin. Um, if you go to Newgrange, because so many thousands and thousands of people visit there every year, you don't really get a lot of atmosphere in it anymore, you know, because it's a tourist site. But just down the road, if you know where to go down the back road, you can climb over a few fences, a few cattle fences and climb into a field, you find two more of them, Nowth and Douth. Now, Nowth is closed, uh, Nowth is closed, it's only open for a few months of the year, and Douth is closed all the time, because um, many years ago, people who were looking for rocks to build fences went and they just started taking the rocks off the top of it, not realizing it was 5,000 years old, you know? And so it's, they don't consider it that safe, so they keep, you can go in and peer into it, and it's fantastic. When you go to Douth, because you have to climb over and go through a few fields and climb over a wall and climb over a fence to get to Douth, because it's you wouldn't know where it was, you know. Um, it's just this massive thing sitting in the middle of somebody's field, 
you know, there's no nothing. And um, but when you go up there, you can feel the energy in that place because nobody ever gets there because only unless you're a local, you wouldn't know where it was. But you can that really feel the energy when you go there. Yeah. So these places and when you get into these fairy mounds, you can feel the energy because you, it's so hard to get into them because, there's, you know, the, only the brave hearted are going to beat their way through the thicket, you know. Um, but there's definitely um, you can definitely feel the energy around these places all year round. But legend, of course, has it that because Samhain is the day that it is, because it is the cusp of the dying of the earth, that it's, you know, it's just sort of grown up that tradition that around Samhain, all of the evil breaks loose on the earth, all of the darkness breaks loose on the earth, but that's also the day when things are particularly thin. So if you wanted to go to a thin place on Samhain, you probably would have quite a lot on your hands, I would imagine, to contend with. Terrific, we've got a question from Margot. She asked, does Scotland have thin places too, due to its Celtic, uh, Celtic connection to Ireland? It does, yeah. Um, I don't know a lot about um, the, the thin places in Scotland, but there definitely are thin places in Scotland. Kieran, I would imagine that there are thin places all over the earth, or am I mistaken? I would imagine so, yeah. They won't be called, oh. probably not called thin places, but they would be thin places, you know. Ter terrific. And we've got a question from Pam. She mentions that she's heard that the thinnest time of the veil is around 4 a.m. each day. And it's a time that um, she uses to pray to her ancestors. She's been to Iona and felt the veil to be really thin. Any thoughts about Iona and the veil and the time of uh, yeah, the, the veil carton? Yeah, I haven't been to Iona. So I don't I haven't experienced what it's like on Iona, but I, I would imagine it's quite powerful there. I mean, that was also, you know, the other the other place that uh, I mean, that was a, uh, where the, the monks, there's an awful when you've got anywhere, even it doesn't have to be folklore, it doesn't have to be Celtic. If you've got a lot of monks who have been praying for centuries in one place that is going to make that place very energetically powerful because of the amount of prayer and devotion that has poured into it, you know, this the way the way it goes, um, the way the energy will work in these places. I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? Uh, and it, it was really you've answered it, I think it was thoughts about the um, the, the oh, time, actually, the time of 4 a.m. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think um, a lot of people wake up at 4 a.m. I think that's also there's an element of body chemistry and sleep patterns involved in that as well. Um, I wake up at 4 a.m. all the time. I can tell you I don't pray. I spend most of the time trying to just get back asleep. But um, but, you know, the and this is, again, what I was saying at the, when I was just talking there at the thin places is at the end. The thing about the thin places is, is that um, you can create them by build like the monks in Iona or, you know, the beehives, they're off the west coast of Ireland. They were in Star Wars where Luke, remember where Luke, did anyone see it, where he went off and he was in these little beehives. So those beehives are thin places as well. But those beehives were occupied by monks, you know, and that's where they that's where they prayed. But I haven't been out to the beehives, but apparently from a friend who was there, that there is quite powerful energy there as well. But again, centuries of hundreds of monks over the, over time praying into that place, creating this thin place there, which is why the, the they say you do that in the, your own corner of your own living room, you will over time be able to create your own thin place. So for me, um, I think wherever you feel most attuned, and if you feel most attuned at 4 a.m., well, then that's probably the time for you. If you feel attuned at 10 p.m. or 1 p.m., whatever, if that's where you find it most easy to really sit, to become very still, to really connect, to be able to connect or attune to that power, I say that's, um, that's the time that's probably going to be most powerful for you to sit and focus and connect. Terrific, Cameron. We've got a couple new questions that have come in. The first one is about St. Patrick. Um, and Nelda says she believes that St. Patrick was about 1500 years ago. Could you talk about him and his contact with this? Well, St. Patrick is not obviously a Celt. St. Patrick was a Briton. Um, and the Celtic tradition is much older than the Christian tradition, obviously. So, and before the Celtic traditions, I mean, the Celts didn't build Newgrange, the, the Gaels built Newgrange. So that was, that was there a thousand years before the Celts arrived. Um, St. Patrick is a Briton that came to, 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 to preach the gospel um, to the wayward pagan Irish who still believed in the two of the Danon or the Xi, you know, so um, it's a different tradition, obviously. 
Terrific. And then Pam asked, or Pam mentions as a chaplain that she's noticed that many people die around four or five a.m. Yeah. when she believes that the veil is thinnest. Mm. Yeah, um, I heard that. It, there, there is something. There is. I've read something about this, and I can't remember it off the top of my head. But there is actually something to do with the movement of the Earth or the energy of the Earth that shifts at that time as well. There's some, I can't remember, I've got to be honest, I can't remember what exactly it is, but there is a, some sort of a geolo geological issue around at 4 a.m. too. So that might, might be why people become very sensitive at that time. Great, and Margaret asks, are fairies and the sheed the same? Yeah, well, yeah, the fairies are what the she have been miniaturized to be, to be able to reconcile the pagan gods with the arrival of Christianity. I mean, this happens a lot in indigenous belief systems around the world. The pagan gods, they don't wanna let go of them because they're so ingrained in the culture, but now they've got, like somebody says, they've got St. Patrick preaching something very new and converting all of the inhabitants of the island to um, Christianity. So then people are faced with what do they do with the gods of their ancestors and how do they reconcile this with this new God they're being told about. And so over time, what happens is these huge, big, powerful she um, become miniaturized into these, you know, mischievous little fairies, which and it's, it was a way of reconciling the gods with the new god. Terrific. And just as a reminder for anyone who has a question, please feel free to add it into the chat. Karen, what do you personally find? Um, do you do you first personally find? that the veil is thinnest as a medium, do you have an easier time connecting with the other side uh, during this time of the year? Uh, well, for me, because I do this all year round, it, it really doesn't make any difference, to be honest to me. This is why they, they say like really some people um, who maybe aren't as sensitive could go to a thin place and they could go to a thin place on Halloween and you know get that extra little oomph in their in their sensitivity to make that connection and then you know some people um don't have to go to a thin place they can create their own thin place or you know for me um i i don't find it really makes that much of a difference what i do find makes a difference is um how present i am in myself and how connected i am in myself all day on a daily basis just in life in general and I find that um, if I'm in that place that we need to be in, that sort of state of attunement, uh, and if I can hold that space and sort of live from that space, then it doesn't really matter when or where the communication needs to happen. But I, I think that probably, and this is just an opinion, a lot of the reason why um, the, these thin places have become sort of these these places to gather for this type of thing is because the energy there is already so strong, it can help you raise your own energy for that kind of state of attunement to happen. So if you can't do that naturally yourself, you can just go there and then benefit from the energy that's being shared with you from the place. So it sounds like you're saying that it's basically an internal job. And if the, if the actual location makes you feel internally more connected, then it's useful. And you can also create that I mean, it's interesting when you were talking about specifically having like a, a space of ritual and um, I, I lived in Mexico and one of the things is pretty, many people probably on this call know is that in the tradition of the Day of the Dead, there are these ofrendas where you put yes. up. Um, and, and so, and it was fascinating to me. And I wonder, do you, and you may or may not have any information, is, is the tradition of the Day of the Dead related to the tradition from the, the Celts coming to Mexico or does it, does it predate that? Is it, does it did it arise independently? I don't think Kells went to Mexico. So I think I don't, I've got to be honest, I'm not an expert at Dia de los Muertos. Um, I do know that a lot of the same traditions exist in both in the both the Samhain tradition and the Dia de los Muertos tradition. There's others, there's um there is this a similar tradition in um India, the Paksha, something it's called in India. Um, there's, a, there's a few different traditions, incredibly similar, but I think when you start getting into looking at mythology, and Carl Sagan will tell you this, and if you start, you know, when you start looking at mythologies across cultures that did not really interact ever going back three, four thousand years, you look at Norse mythology, you look, there's an inordinate number of similarities in mythology, so it's not surprising that a lot of this stuff could arise independently. 
And that's what I kind of suspected that it was independent. Although um, it's interesting, there are uh, there there has been a presence of the Irish in Mexico. And in fact, one little interesting fact is during the Mexican American War, there was the uh, St. Patrick's Battalion that in the middle of the war thought, wait a minute, why are we fighting against the other Catholics? Switch sides during the war and became an Irish um, <laughs> Irish fighting on the side of the Mexicans and oh, uh, cool. are, are quite famous. Yeah, so so the, so the Irish have been in, in Mexico, but I suspect that you're right, as Joseph Campbell would say, is that they, these, these things, it, because they are universal truths, sort of arose independently. We have a comment from Leslie. Leslie says, a synchronicity from Eastern medicine regarding 4 a.m. in the 24 hour cycle of the energy system throughout the body, it's the lung, the lung energy that begins at 4 a.m. and is stronger between four to 6 a.m. The energies of the various primary organs continuing moving one to the next throughout the 24 hours. So that's, um, that's a very interesting fact and thank you for sharing that with us, Leslie. Okay. We have- I think Leslie, yep. there, sorry, I think Leslie, I'm not sure, but I think it's also connected to something to do with the energy of the earth as well. If I think it is, I don't know, maybe somebody can tell me if they know. I thought I came across that at some point. There was a little I bit know, more I know that Leslie... the, the earth, if yep. I, when I wake up before I am in the morning, if the earth does feel different than it does um, at other times. Leslie mentions that the yogis of India awaken at 4 a.m. in order to practice their um, mm. um, pranayam, which is their system of breathing exercises. There's more than this that fits into our time tonight. Thank you for the Irish lineage and culture, she says. And then Leslie mentions metal. Pam says, earth and lung, perfect chance to engage or let go. I love 4 a.m. So there seems to be um, quite a lot of interest in the 4 a.m. time. Mm -hmm. Karen, if you had um, any rec any suggestions on how if people wanted to learn more about Samhain or about the, uh, the, the, do you have any place that they might be able to turn to? Oh, to, to learn more about Samhain. I mean, you can, you can, um... I mean, the Samhain, I think really it's, it's more learning about the fairy folk, maybe or learning more about the she is probably what's interesting about Samhain as well. Um, I mean, WB Yeats has done a great, beautiful collection of the fairy folk of Ireland. He did a lot of work on, on collecting all of those old stories. And I have the book somewhere. I think it's I think it's called the fairy folk. of Ireland. It's a WB Yeats did it anyway. So, you know, so that's a really interesting book. Um, on all of these old old traditions and old beliefs and all surrounding the fairies and the she and whatnot. Um, the Thin Places, um, I'm really, I, I love the Thin Places because that's sort of part archaeology and it's, it's really sort of how ancient cultures, you know, interpreted all of the, the sort of scary events and scary things. Of, you know, I mean, if you go back even further to prehistoric man, I mean, he was coming up with gods for thunder, you know, so you know, we have as human beings through the ages have had a tendency to sort of personify things that scare us. And so um, the thin, but the thin places, what I love about the thin places is that you can actually view them in that old, great, really interesting folkloric sort of way of, of the myth and the fairies and the stories. And the, there's all sorts of great mythological cycles. And, you know, there's, when you start getting into the she, it's fascinating history because to be honest, you start reading about the she and they start sounding actually, to be honest, I'm going to sound like nitty, but they sound actually like aliens because um, there is like Lu was one that was the first king of the she, god of the she. And, and Lu is the light, means light. And Lu was a light that came out of the sky. And he would take people away with him. And if he took people away with him, they would spend a night with, like there was one woman he was taken away, spend a night with Lu. And, when, and then came back and people were all dead, you know, because so much time had passed by on the earth. There's another story of, um, um, oh no, I can't, his name has just gone out of my head. I'll, it'll come back, um, of, a, of um, a, a guy who went off into the light with the she. And, when he, and then he decided, no, he wants to come back to his home. And they said, whatever you do, don't get off your horse. Don't touch the land, you know? And so um, he's going along, and next thing he's staying on his horse. And, but what happened when he came back was a hundred years had passed and everybody he had known was dead. 
And so he, somebody is trying to move a rock and he tries to help them with his horse and the strap breaks and he falls and he hits the land. And as soon as he hits the land, he, he just dissolves. He just dissolves and just dissolves to dust. So there's all these sort of strange references to light gods of light coming out of the sky, to people going into this light, to coming back. And, you know, they stay for a day, they come back a hundred years. Has passed. There's all these sorts of strange ways of interpreting what was going on with these people that I often wondered if the two of the Danum were actually alien visitors, because so much of it is what we know about that literature today, you know, but they were considered the gods, they were all powerful, all knowing, very wise, and, um, and as I said, as Christianity came along, there are actually stories in some of the mythological cycles where humans and she are living side by side. So I don't, they didn't just disappear overnight, it seems like they just became absorbed into the new belief system, the new culture of the country. That's fascinating. Mm. Um, Leslie had mentioned that metal is lungs element, earth is the element of stomach and spleen energies, just to explain something that she did earlier. This is, this is a bit of a, maybe it's a non sequitur or maybe it's not, but Karen, you are, you are a storyteller. You were embedded with the troops in Iraq. You were a, a journalist as, as well as a medium. And there seems to be this, this tradition of, of what, and you mentioned Yates earlier, of wonderful storytellers coming from, from the Celtic and from the Irish traditions. Why do you think that is? I think it's imagination, you know? I think that the Celts have this fabulous imagination. They were beautiful artists, as you know. I mean, and the Celts, there were Gaels in Ireland before the arrival of the Celts. I mean, the Celts came across from Indo-European and they, they kind of came in, into, but, but there were Gaels in Ireland long before the Celts. Um, but the Celts themselves, are very artistic um, culture. I mean, there's beautiful um, silverware and metalwork and all this sort of left by the, by the Celts. But you can see from like Newgrange that even the Gales that preceded the Celts were doing these beautiful carvings. I mean, when you walk inside, um, when you walk inside the passage in Newgrange, you want to see the carvings that are on the, actually I say this, you probably, none of you will appreciate this. Somebody went in one time called Disney and scratched into the wall, Disney 1837. Oh. That scratched into the middle, into the wall inside the chamber of a 5,000 year old Neolithic site. But, but aside from Disney, Mr. Disney, the rest of it was all this beautiful carvings and, you know, stonework. Um, the, the, when, you know, when we started having to contend with the British, then as things went on, um, it be, you know, the British used to say that the, that the Irish were these sort of like these childlike, had this childlike imagination because the Brits were very, you know, Protestant and very Calvinistic and, you know, and, and, and the Irish, meanwhile, were still just by their nature, still quite, quite creative and quite artistic and quite imaginative. Um, and I think that's probably why um, part of the reason why, um, but, but storytelling in particular, I think it's, they say the Irish have the gift of the gab. There's something about storytelling in particular. I mean, we've got beauty, we've got fantastic music comes out of Germany, fantastic art comes out of Italy and whatnot, but these great stories come out of Ireland. And there's just something about the storytelling tradition that's very, very, very old in Ireland that I think is still, still there in the genes somewhere. We've got a couple more questions. I know we're starting to run out of time. Laura asks, if you were going to tell a child about thin places, what or how would you say it or would you? Well, I mean, you know, I grew up with the thin places, like I was saying earlier with the Banshee, you know, it's just part and parcel of it. I mean, you leave your teeth. Why do you leave your teeth under the pillow? So the fairies will take your teeth and leave you money, right? That's the she. The fairies, oh. don't forget, left Ireland and came to America with the Irish, you know? There's all sorts of stories of them trying to ditch them and hide in barrels and stuff and get away from this. That's a whole other, a whole other day's storytelling. But um, that's where the, that's the fairies, the she are the fair, the fairies are the she and they would steal your teeth, you know? But now they give you the money for them. So, you know- So the, the tooth fairy is a she? Is the she, yeah, S-I. So S-I father, but- um, and the, the fairy mans are, are also called she, but it's spelt S-I-D-H-E. The she are the, the, the places that they can come through. But um, yeah, all, any, anything the fairies get up to originated. So, so when you're growing up in Ireland, you just kind of grow up with them around, giving you money for your teeth and screaming outside the rooms, out in the street. You just kind of grow up with it. So um, 
and there's never been a conversation about it. I mean, it's just it's just there. It's just you can't pick it up by osmosis. It's just in the water, in the air, whatnot. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, time. Yeah, if, you're, if you're trying to tell people about the she, you, you just tell them about the fairies. I mean, the kids already know about fairies. So, you know, I don't I I don't know. I don't know if that even answers your question. And Leslie, whoever answered the question. Um. Let's see, we've got time maybe for one more question. Margaret asks, Druids and fairies the same? I associate them with nature and the beneficial. So no, Druids are, um, are individual people with um, special powers, you know, they're, they're of divination, their magic prophecy and stuff like that. But the Druids were considered like the shamans, but the Druids aren't she, if that, if that makes sense. Terrific. Well, I know that we, um, we're starting to run down in time. Let's give a big round of applause to Karen Francis McCarthy. Thank you so much for sharing so much about the history and the culture and also your personal experiences. Um, thank you so much for all of you who've come today. We hope you, you've gotten a lot out of it. And um, if you uh, want to know more about Karen, where could they go to get more information about you? I think... Um, yeah, my website think, probably. Yeah, um, I just I just put KarenFrancisMedium.com. Yeah, that's there, and there is actually a story there in the media page I did um, the Belfast Telegraph a few years ago on Newgrange as well, on the backstory to Newgrange. If anyone's interested, you can find the link on there too, um, if you're interested in reading a little bit more about about Newgrange. So, thank you so much, Karen. Thank you for all of you for coming. Have a wonderful Halloween season, and uh, thank you.